Well, and now we're going on to part two of lecture 10 on radar clutter. And here's the block diagram of the radar. And you remember that uh, clutter uh, is backscatter from unwanted objects, uh, not the target, but from things like, as we said earlier, buildings, sea clutter. And in this section, part two, we're going to focus on rain and on backscatter from birds and insects also. Now, rain has certain attributes that I'd like to go over electromagnetically because of the how they interact with the microwave uh, energy. Uh, rain both attenuates and reflects microwave radar signals. And so we can have problems caused by uh, rain because they, they lessen the, the reflected signal and they do it at, at longer wavelengths, this, this impact uh, is much less. So problems caused by rain lessen dramatically with longer wavelengths, that's lower frequencies. So you have much less a problem at L band, which is 23 centimeters, than X band at one centimeter, and you'll have significant problems at the millimeter wave region, 35 gigahertz. And rain is diffuse clutter, and we'll see that in the next view graph uh, in a picture of a PPI, remember a plane position indicator. It's showing rain is diffuse clutter. It has wide geographic extent. And if we ever think of the weather forecasts that we see, um, they're taken with uh, Doppler radars that have been built exclusively to see rain and not ground clutter, ground black backscatter. And, and are colored to show the, uh, in one case you can show the, the display, show the Doppler velocity of the rain, and in another it shows the, the intensity of the rain. Okay, so big picture, uh, rain, as you remember those TV screens from the weatherman or, or woman, travel horizontally with the wind. And they have wide geographical extent. Sometimes they'll come across as a vertical front and sometimes as a large mass. They could be the rain inside a hurricane. Um, and the rain has a mean velocity and a spread to that mean velocity. And we're going to go over in details a model of how this, how we can model the spread. Now, this is how the backscatter works on a microscopic scale with a raindrop. We have an electromagnetic wave coming in. It refracts into the raindrop, reflects off the back surface of the raindrop, and then refracts coming out. That this would be the reflected electromagnetic energy. Because some of that energy is lost, there's also an attenuation of the radar signal that's caused by rain. So not only do we have um, backscatter coming back that is caused by the rain, but the backscatter coming back from the target ha has to go through the rain so it is attenuated. Now here's a, uh, a PPI display of what we call the normal video. It isn't processed. And this was uh, at 10 mile range rings. Uh, this was taken a long time ago. Uh, 1975 in August at the FAA's test center in Atlantic City. And it's what taken, data taken uh, with an airport surveillance radar, S-band, and that radar could detect a one square meter target like a pipe, pipe of Cherokee at 60 nautical miles. So way out here it could detect a... Uh, what we see here are the hotels along the boardwalk and this was taken at a time where there are a number of casinos, tall buildings. So this is relatively intense clutter of an urban nature. And a lot of these other uh, pieces we see are individual large scatterers. A few of them are um, aircraft. And this is only one scan of the radar. Now, if you see this set of this line right here and here, um, what, what this one is, is an electrical uh, high power um, transmission line. And, and what it's showing, because remember this is a 10 miles, 
It's showing you the backscatter from each of the individual towers. They show up with zero Doppler. We're not using any kind of Doppler processing to get rid of them. And in a, a similar uh, set of uh, reflectors in a line here. If, if we look at that same geographical site on a day in August of 1975 when there was very heavy rain, we see in addition to the same backscatter here from the hotels and the buildings and from the high tension wires and some of these other single we also see two other things. First, the rain. And this will give you an idea of what rain looks like in its extent over, say, a minute. It hasn't moved very fast. It moved, rain moves at 20, 30, 40 miles an hour. 40 in extent. Usually 50, 20 to 30 miles an hour, except if it's a fast-moving front. And we see out here a set of detections which are one right after the other, but they're moving in range. And that's a, an aircraft. An aircraft, and you, if you count the, the number of little slashes as the beam passes by it, remember this is an analog display, we see that the aircraft is either moving in or moving out from one end to the other. And you'd have to see them one at a time to tell whether it was moving in or out. But that would be from 10 scans or so, the, the, the detections in analog fashion. Now, later on, and I'm going to focus on this, this rain here um, is about 30 dB above the receiver noise. That's above black. So this is intense rain, and you certainly would not see this aircraft in this rain. So one of the things that's a job of the signal processor is using what we're going to see as do uh, the Doppler filtering and Doppler processing to delete the rain and see the targets. And also, we're going to, we're going to go through a section where we want to also get rid of the uh, ground clutter and other spurious non-moving targets. Here we see just sort of like a fuzzy area of light rain up here. But all in all, we want to get rid of the, the junk, see the targets, junk I mean the clutter, see the tar and want to see the targets. Okay. I would say that that right there also is another target. And if you look over you can see right here a persistent non-moving target and here we see a persistent non-moving target also so they're probably from the same uh, object fixed in space now rain's backscatter uh, in the radar world is measured um, when I say the radar world, in the world of those who try to detect things like aircraft and moving targets, uh, such as uh, air, oh yeah, aircraft, automobiles, things like that, where you want to not see the rain, um, we characterize the rain by its reflectivity, its cross section that's in meters squared per unit volume because rain has a volumetric extent it isn't flat like ground clutter it's a volumetric entity so if you had a narrow beam a pencil beam we call it you'd want to calculate the volume of the range extent and the the the, the range extent and, and the area extent of the circle and use that to calculate the volume to normalize the reflectivity of the rain per unit volume. So it's measured in D, the sigma z, zero, the reflectivity is measured in dB squared per meter cubed. And here are numbers that are calculated pretty well. For rain at S-band, 
because you can make a very good model. Back in, I think it was the 50s, uh, a Canadian electrical engineer with his last name, I think was Haddock, um, calculated these numbers and they come out right on the ball because it's a Rayleigh, it's a, you can model it with, with a Rayleigh distribution quite nicely. If you have exactly, um, uh, uniformly spherical, uh, wa droplets of water. And in that region, the rain reflectivity increases as the frequency to the fourth power or one over lambda to the fourth power. You can see that effect quite strongly. So moderate rain at S band is four orders of magnitude greater per unit volume as it is at K band, 35 gigahertz. So rain clutter at S band um, is a significant one, it turns out, when you put into volumes of typical radars and at higher frequencies. If you're dealing with UHF or VHF, the uh, backscatter is so low that uh, it's really not a problem for those radars. Now I'm going to go over uh, one technique that was used for many years and, and uh, is still used to mitigate, to some extent, uh, rain from a radar. The assumption is that we're going to, what we're going to do is use transmit circular polarization and look at the effect of circular polariz polarized transmit beam on a raindrop. So uh, the assumption is that the raindrops are spherical and circular polarization is transmitted and we'll assume it's right-handed circular. The reflected energy has the opposite sense of polarization because of the phase change at that point in the raindrop. And what will come back is left-handed circular polarization. Okay? And what you'll see is that in figure to receive only the sense of polarization that's transmitted because the reflections have been changed you can reject rain by about 15 dB. But unfortunately, raindrops are not completely spherically uh, symmetric. There's a, an oblate, they're somewhat non-spherical. And 15 dB is about the limit in suppression that one can get. Uh, most atmospheric targets our complex scatters and return both senses of polarization equally right and left-handed and so the targeted echo will be significantly attenuated because you're receiving only one sense of polarization and so you can get about 15, 12 to 15, 18 dB of, of uh, rejection using this technique of circular polarization. Now with attenuation of rain at 18 degrees centigrade, here are some graphs of how, uh, and these are average rainfall rates. And I want to take a moment first. If you've ever stood outside and it's, uh, well, who stands outside in the rain? So you've been caught outside in the rain going from uh, a building to a parking lot. And on your way over, it wasn't raining. And then it comes down and it's raining cats and dogs. It's really coming down very, very heavy. And then by the time you get to your car, the rain settles down to a more moderate rate. What's happened is a storm cell that's well localized has passed over you. And so the important thing isn't the rainfall rate that's averaged, and uh, people average it when they say it. Well, we're getting an inch an hour rain. What they'll do is they'll put out a a graduated cylinder and come back in a, an hour and see how, how many millimeters we got in an hour. Well, in part of the hour, you might be getting seven or eight times that amount or ten times that amount. So rain in time, its, in its intensity can change and also the attenuation to the radar from cell to cell. But for rainfall rates, which for a drizzle is about a quarter of a millimeter an hour, light rain a millimeter an hour, 
moderate rain, four millimeters in an hour, up to a very excessive rain, it's very rare, 40 millimeters an hour. Um, the, the, these are the, the graphs you'd get on the attenuation in dB per kilometer one way. So you notice that at um, X band, you're going to get 1 dB per kilometer. So if you're out at uh, 30 kilometers, you'd have 30 dB of attenuation. And that's one way from the rain. So that means that's a very, very strong attenuation of the rain at X band and under heavy, con under those conditions. Now, the next question is how often do you get rain that, that much? And you get, say, 60 hours of rain a year at 4 millimeters an hour. At 40 millimeters an hour, it's exceeded only two hours in a year. And a quarter of a millimeter an hour, uh, 450 hours per year. So that's like, and that's in Washington, D.C. Now, in the heavy rainforests of uh, Southeast Asia, these are very different numbers. When you're in the desert region of, say, the Sahara, very different numbers. Europe, temperate zone, you know the different areas in the United States, and these are well documented in many places. But this is to give you an idea that in some conditions, under some geographical conditions, you're going to have to take into account clearly the attenuation of rain. Now, if we look at the reflectivity, uh, and this would be in... Um, in meters to the minus one, that I is a, is a uh, typo, and uh, that's meters to the minus one, and that would be uh, millimeters squared per, uh, excuse me, meters squared per meter cubed, that reflectivity we talked about earlier. Uh, rain at 15 millimeters an hour would be here. Insects would be down here, very small. Reflectivity and the fluctuation of the atmosphere would be here. And at about, this is a log scale, notice these are. Uh, a one meter squared uh, with an air for, a one meter squared target, small single engine, Piper Cherokee, something like that. On an airport surveillance radar at 10,000 feet at 30 miles would be there. So uh, rain would be more, uh, you know, powerful. In, in its backscatter, and you wouldn't be able to see it. So that says you've got to better develop a technique where you'll be able to handle rain at S band and higher frequencies. And here I, is that same table as before, and here is how the rain is calculated. Now, um, if you look, in Merrill Skolnick's third edition, uh, I haven't put in the derivation, but there's uh, another parameter that characterizes rain for people who are interested in seeing rain as a target. And it's measured in dBz. And I'm going to assign you right now a, pro a problem to relate the parameters in this equation for, say, 4 millimeters an hour rain, uh, how does 4 millimeters an hour rain in an airport surveillance radar, what would, if it's a certain cross-section at a certain range at X-band, what would be its dBZ value? And I wanted to answer the question, why do weather, weather radar people use this DBZ quantity? There's a page and a half in uh, Merrill Skolnick's book on uh, weather radars and, and the quantity DBZ. And you should be comfortable going back and forth in the derivations of these and understanding where you see one and the other and how they are. So that's one problem that you'll have. Uh, it, it won't be in the back where it says problems for this lecture. That's one thing I want you to do for the course. Now, what does in amplitude and linear units rain really look like if you measure its amplitude as a function of slant range? And this would be the, 
the noise level would be below here. And, I, and I, these are in arbitrary linear units. And this was taken from Fred Nathanson's book. And it shows you here is 40 millimeter an hour rain, and here is 10 millimeter an hour rain. And I want you to see the choppiness of it. So it can go from, which is a big difference, over maybe a mile and a half. And here we see a, a rain cloud where we see low levels of rain. And here we see, we go up and we see a big cloud of rain, which has an extent of about, oh, if that's 0.2 miles, then this would be probably uh, half a mile in extent. Okay. And the, this data was taken with a C-band radar at these different azimuths and with this, of course, has a, a longer pulse width, so it's got uh, the, the, the values are of an, an inch on the graph are different than down here. And this is with a 0.2 microsecond pulse width. And these are the values of the theoretical. Now, so here's some other measured data, which shows you the different Doppler spectra of rain. Now, just imagine in your mind, you're uh, you're standing out in a oh uh, a plain, uh, P L A I N in Kansas, and you look over and you see a rain rain cloud coming, and you've got a little radar going around. Well, if if, if, if the rain is coming from the, uh, the north, it's going to be coming straight towards you, and you're going to have a significant Doppler velocity, the rain is. If you look sideways, as the rain hits you, the rain is going to be moving tangentially to you, and there'll be zero Doppler velocity to the rain as likewise over in 180 degrees away. But there'll be a plus and a minus Doppler, whether it's coming towards you or away from you, whichever is the right plus or minus. But what you can see at different azimuths, a rainstorm at 90 degree azimuths, we see a, a bump here at, at zero velocity. And this is with, uh, we're measuring over plus or minus 60 knots. And then we look at 320 degrees, and we see the, the double bump, the bimodal distribution is moved over to negative, well, it, it's at about negative 30, the mean is. And, and over here, it's down near the noise level of the radar. And at this particular in this particular graph, which I believe is this one over here at 90, we did a uh, just an eyeball. Remember, these are logarithmic units and they're linear here. A fit, and the spread of the rain is about six knots. Now, when you have a spread six knots, you say, "Oh, that's relatively small." But what you're going to find is that there are side lobes to this rain, and you're going to have to suppress the rain an awful lot. So it's not just, this doesn't go down instantly to infinity. Um, there's going to be rain over here. And, and I, you, the side lobes of the Doppler filters, as you'll see in the future, we're going to put the rain through. That's two lectures from now, and, and the targets and everything. Uh, is going to be uh, different. First of all, the thing you want to point out that here is the rain is not Gaussian. Here it's, qu it's quite obviously bimodal. The mean velocity varies as the storm moves by the radar. Um, and here are examples of rain that was approximately 20 millimeters an hour. And the winds on the ground were 30 knots and 50 knots at 6,000 feet. And, that, and that's typical for, for, for a good, heavy rainstorm. 
So it may only be moving at 30 knots on the ground, but it can be really moving quite a lot faster up above, which means higher Doppler velocities, which means you're, uh, where airplanes are flying, you're going to have to deal with that, those issues, which are, are counterintuitive to a person standing on the ground. Now here's, uh, I'm going to show you in the next two view graphs, the effects of wind shear on the Doppler spectrum, and also uh, other effects that spread the rain. So it isn't a delta function of just the velocity coming towards you. Uh, it, this shows wind shear, and that the wind velocity is a function of height changes. And so there's a vertical gradient to the wind. And that transforms into a velocity spectrum, delta V sub R. So that it's just the fact that the wind velocity is high up above and lower on the ground and that the, the beam width, it's going to depend on the beam width, for an airport surveillance radar, which has a very wide beam width, because it wants to see all aircraft at all altitudes, not just a thin pencil beam, it's going to have a significant effect on the spread of the spectrum. Now here, here's the model developed by Fred Nathanson for the velocity spectrum of rain. And he's basically saying it's the square root of the sum of all these different four effects. First, the shear, which, which is, the show, is the gradient in meters per second per kilometer that we talked about just before. And it's about four averaged over 360 degrees. And this is a formula for it. And these have been empirically developed. Turbulence within the, the actual beam is about a meter per second. And uh, because the rain is different within the beam, it is a function of the beam width, there's another term. And then that the, there's a, uh, the rain's fall rate within the beam will change. And that depends on the elevation angle, the sign of the elevation in meters per second. So what it's saying, basically, is the shear can be about 3 meters per second. And the other effects are quite small. And when you take the square root of the sum of the square, you get about 3.3 .3 meters per second, typically. We got 6 knots, which is about, it's in the norm. This is a reasonable model if one wants to develop a spectrum for the uh, spectrum model for rain. Now, if you're in a tornado, I mean, or a hurricane, it's a whole different bowl of wax. Now we're going to take a break here.